This is a story about the violence, the sex, the jungle, buxom, beautiful girls in sort of full 3D. A man. He's a very striking man. Just looking at him is like put in awe. Whenever you see Itagaki at any of these press conferences or shows, he's a very sort of rock star guy. Who made a game? What made Dead or Alive so great was its speed and a fluidity, which is really unique to their games. That saved a floundering developer. Dead or Alive literally means dead or alive. For the company, it was a very critical situation. And raised the bar for 3D fighters. It was just Tomonobu Itagaki asking the question, what can we do? How can we expand the fighting game genre? Can we take it in a more mature direction? DOA is like a sushi bar with roller skating girls serving wasabi on the sushi. It's fun. This is the history of Dead or Alive. While growing up in Japan, Tomonobu Edagaki knows exactly what he wants to do when he grows up. Well, like everybody else, I entered the game industry because I wanted to make video games. His wish comes true in 1992. I had no idea which company would be good for me, so I didn't care if I worked for Tecmo or Sega. And Tecmo was located close to where I lived, so that's why I chose Tecmo. Big American hit was a Tecmo Bowl for the NES. Ready, down, put, put, put. And that was just a simply brilliant football game. Yeah. And it was surprising because it came from a Japanese company. I worked as a graphic programmer for the Super Famicom in my early days at Tecmo. Edagaki's first project is Tecmo Super Bowl for the Super Nintendo. As he climbs the corporate ladder at Tecmo, a new innovation in fighting games shows up in arcades. The big development in fighting games in the early 90s was uh, moving to 3D. The early pioneers in 3D fighting games, you have to speak about Yu Suzuki and the Virtua Fighter series. Just when that came out in the arcades, it was astounding. People had been used to fighting in two dimensions, moving back and forth and maybe jumping over one another but not actually moving in three dimensions. But while arcade fighting games are going through a minor renaissance, Tecmo is facing troubled times. Tecmo was not in great shape. They had a lot of deficits for two years. So in terms of business, if the company had three years of consecutive deficits, it would have been very critical. The up-and-coming developer makes a bold move. I made a deal with the current president, Mr. Nakamura, to start a project. I made a promise to him that I would make a game that would sell. And for this struggling company, it's their last chance. So, dead or alive literally means dead or alive. For the company, it was a very critical situation. That's how he came up with the title. Edagaki wants his game to stand out in the crowd. I liked Virtua Fighter, but if I use different ideas to describe it, I would say it's an old traditional sushi restaurant. And on the contrary, the DOA is like a sushi bar with roller skating girls serving wasabi on the sushi. It's fun. For the beginner, fighting games were not easy. So that's why when designing Dead or Alive, we tried to simplify such aspects of the game as much as possible. One new idea is the danger zone. The danger zone is kind of like a joker when you're gambling and playing cards. Before a danger zone, there was a notion that fighters were fighting inside a ring, and maybe if they went outside that ring, they would lose the match. We wanted to add something entertaining and spice up the fighting game genre. That's why we created the danger zone. 
But now, with Dead or Alive 1, a danger zone was activated, where if you entered that zone, you would take damage. It made fighting more strategic. You're limited in your space, and if you go outside that space, you're not going to lose the match, but you're going to jeopardize your position. Another element that separates Dead or Alive from the other 3D fighters is a little provocative. The first Dead or Alive game featured the first uh, movable breasts in video gaming. At times, it would be like almost like you were watching a, a Skinamax movie. Well, I think entertainment needs sexuality and violence. So if entertainment lacks sexual elements, then it's entertainment no more. Ironically, Dead or Alive is developed for the same Model 2 arcade hardware that powers Sega's Virtua Fighter 2. However, Sega is not involved with the development of the game. I had an EO lunch once with Yu Suzuki. That's the only relationship I've had with Sega. I have never received any programming resources from the company. In November 1996, Dead or Alive ships out to arcades around the world. Tecmo holds its breath and puts its faith into the girls of DOA. It's November 1996, and Dead or Alive has just shipped off to arcades. The game is one of Tecmo's last gambles to stay in business, and it hits the jackpot. The first Dead or Alive did very well in terms of sales. It's certainly a very good game to play. Well, Mr. Nakamura was very happy about the success of DOA, so other Tecmo games could be created and sold. The previous year, Tecmo posted a loss of $5.2 million, but in 1996, Tecmo pulls in a profit of $9.2 million, thanks in part to Dead or Alive. What made Dead or Alive so great was that there's a, all of Tecmo's games have a speed and a fluidity, which is really unique to their games. There's just a, an amazing sense of control about the game. I'm different from the other game designers because I work to win, so my way of thinking is much different from the others. Work begins on home versions of Dead or Alive, as well as a sequel. To get the job done, Edagaki creates his own development team made up of the best of the best from Tecmo. It was reasonable to establish a brand because at the time, Tecmo was not releasing a lot of games. That's why we were trying to create a new brand. And that's why Team Ninja was created, to give Tecmo an identity. Team Ninja members all have certain levels of skills. Compared to other development companies, ours is much higher. It's easy to work with such highly skilled people. Team Ninja is a, is a mystery. Tomonobu Itagaki really likes Team Ninja to be sort of like ninja-like in the way it handles itself. Itagaki doesn't let people inside it. Very few people ever get to see the inner workings of Team Ninja. He's not very active in speaking about its history. He likes it to be sort of in the shadows. He likes the games to speak for themselves. <laughs> Team Ninja was created to turn the table, to change the situation of the company, which was in bad shape. In September 1997, Dead or Alive is released for the Sega Saturn. It comes to the PlayStation one year later. Dead or Alive was remarkable because it really did 3D fighting well on the PlayStation and on the Saturn. And those systems were just beginning to find themselves in terms of three-dimensional fighters. The developers were sort of struggling, like, how do we get to push all these polygons and to still make a good, smooth fighting game? Dead or Alive was one of the first ones to actually do it very, very well on a home console. In 1999, Dead or Alive 2 hits arcades. Dead or Alive 2 improved on the original in a lot of ways. Beyond the graphics, the amount of move sets available for the characters expanded greatly. Each character has their own separate story. When I started making the game, there wasn't a lot of characters involved in games like Street Fighter. So back then, characters only meant the difference in one's costume. So when I designed the characters, I put a lot of concentration into each one's voice, taste, and attitude. I designed characters based on their personality. And there were multi-tiered stages, so players could beat your opponent in a very flashy way. Bang them against the wall, flip them over, and then knock them across something that's going to explode. You could knock a character through a wall over like a cliff, and they would actually plummet and take damage. 
It's a really neat way to expand the genre. Come on! In early 2000, a home version of Dead or Alive 2 comes out for the Dreamcast. PS2 owners have to wait until December of that year to finally get a copy of the hot sequel. Get ready, fly! The differences between the Dreamcast Dead or Alive 2 and the PlayStation 2 version, which was subtitled Hardcore, there were a lot of different lighting effects. In fact, a lot of people complain that the lighting effects were overdone. There was an overbrightening effect that made everything look sort of bleached out to the point where you actually lost some of the really sharp, striking coloring that was seen in the Dreamcast version. There were new costumes added and a lot of graphical fineries done for the PlayStation 2, which was supposedly a marked increase over the Dreamcast version. But basically, the two games in their core were identical. Dead or Alive 2 brings in more than $2 million in sales. Plans for Dead or Alive 3 begin, but what Team Ninja has in mind is a radical departure. By 2001, the Dead or Alive series is in the same league as other 3D fighting classics, such as Virtual Fighter and Tekken. But Adagaki wants to set the bar even higher with the next edition. To do so, he makes two bold decisions. The first is to skip creating an arcade version of Dead or Alive 3. But, uh, American... In the American market, even though you can still find arcades, it's pretty dead, so it's useless to provide arcade games for them. It's the same situation in Japan, so it's useless to provide arcade games for them as well. The second is to develop the new game exclusively for Microsoft's new console, the Xbox. One of the most important reasons why we developed the OA3 exclusively on the Xbox was that we could concentrate on just making the game. In the case of the PlayStation 2, when we want to realize an idea, we can't concentrate on just making a game. It involves preparing a specific library just for our ideas. That's too troublesome. Working on the Xbox was an ideal situation. We could concentrate solely on making the game. Fan reaction to the Dead or Alive series going on Xbox was certainly mixed. Tomonobu Itagaki made a conscious decision to take Dead or Alive to Xbox. A lot of fans were disappointed by that, but a lot of Xbox fans were ecstatic. <laughs> It's a very good series, and it's now exclusive to Xbox. I didn't think choosing to develop exclusively on the Xbox was a big gamble, because comparing the machine specifications to systems like the PS2, Xbox was much higher. I make my games to win. I can make a better game with a higher spec machine, so as a writer, I'm like a fighter pilot. The PS2 is like a zero fighter, while the Xbox is like a Hellcat. I had confidence to win with the Xbox, so it was quite easy. In November 2001, Dead or Alive 3 comes out exclusively for the Xbox, and gamers are floored by the new title. It was a great game, great fighting game, and you know, people really liked the idea of having this sort of fantastic fighting game that showed off the power of the Xbox. Without Dead or Alive 3, I think the Xbox uh, would have had trouble courting a lot of the hardcore fans who absolutely need a great fighting game on their gaming system. Dead or Alive 3 did very well on Xbox. It was a launch title. Tomonobu Itagaki and Team Ninja got the graphics spot on. They showed the world exactly what the Xbox could do. He expanded on the notion of multi-tiered stages. Not only could you knock somebody off a platform safe, but you could knock them off a huge platform and they would go through a floor and bounce down. Ah! The environments were absolutely amazing and beautiful. There were really picturesque environments I don't think could be rendered on any other gaming system. And for a company like Microsoft with the Xbox, their goal was to really try and, you know, find games that would show why the Xbox is a better system than the PlayStation 2. And Dead or Alive is one of the only games, I think, that really sort of showed the power of X, as they say. 
Both Microsoft and Tecmo win big. Only five months after its release, Dead or Alive 3 sells more than one million copies worldwide. Already, Edagaki has plans for another addition to his growing franchise. But what he has in mind is a little different. It's 2003. Dead or Alive 3 is a hit. And Team Ninja starts work on a new game which has been on Edagaki's mind since Dead or Alive 2. When I was developing DOA 2, fans requested that we add beach volleyball as a minigame because other fighting games had similar minigames. Itagaki has a very <laughs> playful nature. He had an idea. What if these women were on an island and they had two weeks to have a lot of fun and play some volleyball? You know, maybe from just a simple daydream you know, a, a whole video game emerged. But I didn't want to put this very simple idea into my series. So when I made the beach volleyball game, I wanted it to be a standalone title. In January 2003, Edagaki's self-proclaimed gift to gamers is released in the form of Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball. One of the hallmarks of the Dead or Alive franchise has been these buxom, beautiful girls in full 3D. That's like what people associate with Dead or Alive, or these, you know, kind of completely over-the-top girls that Itagaki really prizes himself on creating these sort of amazing babes. I'm creating entertainment rather than just a video game. So in terms of entertainment, it's quite natural for me to create beautiful women. It makes sense rather than bringing ugly women into the game. It's very simple. Naturally. While the new game already shows off plenty of skin, it's not enough for some gamers. In fact, I find the nude hacks irritating. If they're so talented at doing such things, why don't they use their skills for something more meaningful? So when you see a girl in DOA, I can understand why one would want to undress her. But if you do so, you really should be embarrassed. And it's the eye candy that gets Tecmo into trouble at 2003's E3. People flock to see women in bikinis, and Tecmo knows this. Dead or Alive beach models promoting Dead or Alive extreme beach volleyball threw out volleyballs and people would go nuts. It's just good fun. At times it's become such good fun that fire marshals had to come and actually close Tecmo down for a while. While the world falls in love with the women of Dead or Alive, Edagaki and Team Ninja continue to expand the DOA franchise. Due out in 2004 is Dead or Alive Ultimate, the first DOA game with an online element. Dead or Alive Ultimate was only shown on huge screens at E3. There were a lot of striking images shown. Just absolutely insane. There was this one where you were in sort of this like African safari. One of the fighters knocked the other into a pool and then picked him up and spun him into an elephant. People love that stuff. It was very well received. Dead or Alive Ultimate is like an archive. We're releasing it for fans of Team Ninja's work, such as the DOA series and Ninja Gaiden. The ultimate thing that they've done, so to speak, is bring the game on Xbox Live for online fighting. And because Dead or Alive is so fast-paced, I think that's what people love about the idea of doing it online. And there are still more Dead or Alive games in the works beyond DOA Ultimate. Dead or Alive Code Cronus is the world of Dead or Alive Zero, before the first DOA. You've seen the opening movie in Dead or Alive Ultimate with the children. Dead or Alive Code Cronus has a relationship with that movie. As far as Dead or Alive 4, it's coming out for the next Xbox. Dead or Alive 4 will be a game describing the world of DOA tech, which is the counterpart of the ninja side. Dead or Alive has grown to be one of Tecmo's most successful franchises, thanks in part to its mysterious creator. Everybody give it up for the amazing Tomo Nobu Itagaki. He's a very striking man. Just looking at him is like put in awe. He's always got sort of shades on, he's got the black leather jacket. He prides himself as being a real rock star of the industry. He's a very nice man, he's a very smart man, 
who is very passionate about video games. He's very outspoken. He will tell you exactly what he thinks of certain games, what's right and what's wrong with Dead or Alive. He says these sort of crazy, over-the-top things that you just don't believe come out of his mouth. No violence. Violence. Entertainment. Beauty. Sex. Gambling. Gambling means that if people really like playing a game, then they'll pay whatever it costs. And that's all. What's up? I'm Dave Navarro. And I'm Carmen Electra, and we're going to be your hosts this year at Gphoria. Gphoria, the award show for gamers, with special guests Aisha Tyler, Tony Hawk, and Anna Nicole Smith. Musical performances by Phantom Planet and Jadakiss, and exclusive looks at Splinter Cell Chaos Theory and Need for Speed Underground 2. It all starts tomorrow at 7.30 with red carpet arrivals. Gphoria, presented by EB Games and Jeep.